get it. Yeah, he knows. All right, so tell us about Jen Silent. What is the film about, and what inspired you to want to make this movie? Jen Silent is about this phenomenon that's going on where LGBT older people seem to be going back into the closet because they're scared of the people either taking care of them or in some cases they are getting bullied by the people they are living with in nursing homes and care facilities. So the reason I wanted to do it was because for me as a gay man, you know, regardless of whether they're baby boomers or the war generation or whatever, these folks are my greatest generation. They're the ones that made it possible for me to um, talk with you today and be out and open and everything that we're hoping to have now is really me standing on their shoulders and hopefully at some point somebody will be standing on my shoulders to take it to whatever the next level of equality and civil rights are out there for LGBT people. What was the single greatest psychological or emotional obstacle uh, that you had to overcome uh, to make this film? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I would say that the hardest part was becoming a caregiver for Chris Ann, the transgender woman who's in the film, because uh, it was unanticipated. I, we were spending so much time with this particular person in the film, and her family had, uh, you know, uh, not been there for her and while we were shooting all this hours of footage while we were shooting all these hours of footage it became clear that you know I was the best person to also be taking care of her as well so that became very hard but the very hardest part was reviewing all those hours of footage in the edit afterwards and reliving all those moments of having to help her down the stairs or uh, um, just the little difficulties that come up when you try to, you know, um, age. Hmm. How would you describe the emotions? It's a lot of work to edit a film, of course, so you're watching a lot of footage for a lot of time, but how would you describe your emotions in, in some of those more touching moments, if you will, watching footage of her? It, it, uh, it feels almost like you shouldn't be there. You, are, you get so close with the people who you're following and you're there with a camera that when you go back and look at some of this footage, it's almost that feeling of this, I'm, I'm invading their privacy, you know what I mean? So um, there's that feeling and then there's the, an immense feeling of trust that they've given you. Uh, duty, I don't know what the right word is, uh, to tell their story the way they are expecting you to tell it because they have opened their life up completely to you. Very cool. Well, one of the things that I find most inspiring... Can you look a little bit sort of squeezed into that chair? Can you just relax? Maybe put your... Sure. Yeah, just relax. Is that okay? I don't want to hunch. That's why I was doing So this I is good? I wouldn't worry. Yeah, okay. just be comfortable. Thanks. You look awesome. Yeah, you do. Uh, one of the things that I find most inspiring about your story is that you are pushing this film so much on your own. Uh, without the backing of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but without the backing of a major studio or distribution company. Can you talk about that specifically? How important is it to you as a producer, director, writer uh, to receive a distribution deal? Is that important to you? No, receiving a distribution deal is not important to me because I think that this type of film is not something that a regular distributor would know what to do with, and here's why. A regular distributor is going to put it on television or release it for home home video of home DVD. Uh, that's great, and um, I'm looking forward to that. We've been on PBS, and we'll hope to release the DVD later this year. But here's why a regular distributor wouldn't work for this. What we do is we show this film through community organizations, and they get a theater like this. They bring in aging advocates and LGBT advocates together in one room. The lights come up after the screening and everybody is sitting there talking about what we should do in our community to address this issue. That doesn't happen when you distribute this on home DVD. So yes, all that would be great, but this is where the real work of social change documentary takes place. Can right you do here. both? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's not a priority. You know, I, I honestly, if you want to talk about distrib distribution routes, I don't think the traditional distribution routes are the way to go with, you know, independent documentary at all. I mean, I think 
that self-distribution has been really good for us. And I think all the tools are out there for us to successfully self-distribute. Can you take us through, uh, I've got several major steps here in you know, possibly your documentary filmmaking process. First, how did you develop the idea for this? Where, where did you, where did the idea come from? How did you develop it? How long does that take? I mean, did you know right away, okay, the, the aging issue is what I want to focus on? Or No, I was, I was doing another film uh, several years ago called Bob and Jack's 52 Years of Venture. Let me start over. I was doing another film a couple of years ago called Bob and Jack's 52 Year Adventure. And in that film, we follow two gentlemen who've been together their entire lives. And as I was doing that, I was realizing all these issues that they have to go through as aging gay elders, as opposed to, say, your straight counterparts who are grandparents, you know, your grandparents or whatever. Um, and that's when I got interested in looking into the unique problems of LGBT elders. And it was much broader than, than just not having Social Security survivor benefits, which is important. It was a whole set of fear that they bring to the equation from everything that they've gone through in their past. Things like being institutionalized, making them scared of hospitals today, not trusting police, not wanting to call the police if they've been broken into because they, the, it's the police that would beat them down 50 years ago. I mean, they're not afraid of being hurt. There's just a general distrust that sticks with you through your life. So um, I was real interested in looking into that. Sure. So you, you, you conceived of this idea, how long before the wheels begin to, you know, meet the concrete where you're able to actually start filming this and talk us through that process? Um, I think the first, the first part of the process is coming up with kind of your thesis of what this documentary is going to be about. And the second part of the process is being willing to change that as you start researching and finding other nuances of it. And uh, I think from the point we started with our idea to the point we started shooting was probably not a lot. It was probably about six to eight months because the idea had been in the back of my head. It was just a matter of finding these people who told the different parts of the story and for LGBT people, it's also finding the L, a representation of the L, lesbian, the gay, the bisexual, and the transgender. And not only that, finding older people who were willing to go on camera. So that was the first part. Then we decided that we were going to focus on them for a year. So that's the second part, for a year. And then the post-production went pretty quickly, six to eight months. Um, but we had about 70 hours of footage, so uh, that was a lot to go through in that time. That's, yeah. Yeah, one of the big questions I have uh, is structure, story structure. Uh, and I'm sure it's something you live, breathe, breathe and, and eat a, a lot with the three films that you've done. Uh, so do you outline a story arc first? Talk about structure. It sounds like okay. you said you wanted a representation from the lesbian community, the gay community, transgender community. So that's some part of the structure. But then how do you, how do you organize the film from beginning to end to, to tell a story? You do your research on the, on the subject and you have all these uh, points on a piece of paper that you think are important to include, little parts of their story. You know their routine and you know generally what they're going through. For example, with Lawrence and Alexander, there, here's a man taking care of his partner who's ill. You kind of know where that story is going to go. So you begin shooting uh, hoping that um, it progresses like you expect, but at the same time being perfectly willing to go with the flow, too. You can't lock into your idea. You have to be completely willing to change at the last moment to make the best documentary. Is that pretty, pretty much, uh, it seems like that's essential, to just see where the footage, where an interview will lead you, uh, and you may not know what the next interview is going to be, and it may be that doing an interview with Lawrence and Alexander leads to doing another interview. Is that, is it kind of organic that way? It, you're right. It is organic in that you have to see where things develop, but don't make the mistake of not having that, that outline to start with. Because if you start going into production, really, or even pre-production of your research, without an idea of what your film is about, boiled down basically to a sentence, literally, 
you're going to spend a lot of extra time and money and resources trying to find it out on the back end, and you may not have it at that point. Mm. Very well what said. What is that sentence? For this film? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. For this film, that sentence is, uh, what's the tagline of the film? Uh, LGBT, the, the generation that fought hardest to come out is going back into the closet to survive. Okay, so the, there's a sentence that can be my litmus test for every action I take on this film. I can make decisions about interviews based on that. When I want to, uh, I, I don't get sidetracked is the most important thing. Hmm. So you said you shot 70 hours of footage, and that's, this is a feature length film, right? So it's, it's 63 minutes, so. Somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. Is that typical about, about 70 hours for 60 to 70 minutes worth of footage? How did that, how did that compare to the first two uh, documentary films? Um, this is much more footage than the other two films because we're following six people over the course of a year as opposed to one or two people over the course of, say, six or seven weeks. Um, and I think that it was important to make them feel comfortable just to be rolling all the time. Sure. Uh, how do you edit? Do you edit the films yourselves? Do you edit as you go along? Do you collect all of your footage and then do your edit? I collect all the footage and then do a rough edit and then look at where the holes are that, uh, of, of what we still have unanswered story-wise and shot-wise and then go back and reshoot what's called pickups, you know. Okay, good. So you're sort of filling in the holes if there's holes in the story? Yeah, I mean, I really like to save part of my resources and budget to be able to go back and fill in the holes especially after you do focus grouping. Cool, uh, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, at, at what point in your process does film marketing become a dominant part of your thinking? Uh, at what point do you begin thinking about planning the steps you'll take to distribute and market a film? Is that right from the start? Or do you kind of see where the film is going first and then say, oh, we could target certain film festivals and? Well, I think the big mistake that people make is not knowing from the set, let me try that again. I think the biggest mistake people make is not knowing from the outset, from the first day of research, who their audience is gonna be. I mean, that's the first thing you need to research. And it can't be the world. I mean, that's kind of not realistic. You need to target um, children. Well, what kind of children? Well, children two to four, or uh, children who live in a particular part of the country or, uh, or are trying to address a certain uh, need, maybe children who have a certain illness or uh, background. So, you know, if you, the more you think about it, the more you come up with your audience. And once, you, in this case, for this film, it's uh, people who are thinking, I say probably 40 to 60, who are thinking about um, their later years. It's not people younger, and frankly, it's not people older who are there because they know it, they're there. Um, what we're trying to do is, you know, get people in that age to think about it. But, so yeah, the marketing takes place from the get-go. And you continue to stick by that plan throughout your production. So what would you say was the catalyst that made you want to become a storyteller, a filmmaker, to work in television and film? I mean, was there a defining moment in childhood? Did you have an early job? Or was it, what was it? It was an early job. I was a television reporter, and I was always the guy that they tried to make go do the hard news story and always wanted to go do the story about the two twins who are, you know, uh, the beauty queens or something like that, you know. I always liked those human interest stories, and I could only do them for maybe a minute and a half, two minutes at a shot, and I got tired of working on s such great stories in such small amounts of time. So I began working with networks who allowed me to do longer format things and finally got into a position where I could go do my own projects. And, uh, but if you look at my, my films, they're still kind of like little news packages strung together. I, I can't get out of that habit. Can you separate the, the role of the documentary filmmaker from being a journalist and a storyteller, or are they just inextricably linked together, a journalist and storyteller? God, all those things are such uh, lofty lofty positions, you know, what is a journalist or a documentary filmmaker or storyteller, you know, I, I, it really depends on what you want to do. I think a documentary filmmaker is both 
you know, it can be one or the other depending on what you want to do. So when you're putting a, a documentary together, what exactly are you looking for that you know will tell a compelling story uh, without writing a script? You know, this is not, right. it's not like a, you know, like a fictional film where you're writing a script and planning everything out. What are you looking for from the interviews you're doing that says to you, okay, this is a compelling story? That's a really important question. The first thing you look for is a good story. Like, what is, what is their beginning to end uh, thing that they're going to tell you about, whether it's visually or, or as an interview on camera? Then you look and see how well they can tell that story. Uh, if they have the best story in the world and they just can't speak very interestingly, you know, you have to figure out a different way around that. The third thing is you look for how are you visually going to tell that story because you can't put that person on camera for an hour, say, in the case of a documentary. You have to have the visual materials to support it. Uh, in the case of LGBT older people, it's a lot of times pictures for, uh, out from albums, uh, old films, things like that. Archival materials are really interesting. So are you looking for, in addition to that, are you looking for sort of a transformative arc? Are you looking, like in the case of Alexander and Lawrence, you kind of knew, you know, where that story was going. Are you looking for those kinds of stories that you can see, you know, a natural flow to the story arc? I feel confident enough in my storytelling experience that I can create an ending if it doesn't happen naturally. That's not to say making up an ending, but taking where that person is at that point, say after you're, you're done with your budget of shooting, and telling in an interesting way where they happen to be at that point in their lives. Because I mean, if you look at Lawrence and Alexander, we don't carry them to the end when, when Alexander passes away. We jump off, and with all documentary, you gotta jump off at some point, otherwise you'll be doing it for 10 years. <laughs> Sound familiar? <coughs> it does. Uh, so tell us about how you collect and utilize B-roll footage. I mean, like, yeah. let's say you're doing an interview on a Tuesday with someone. Are you going to shoot B-roll footage around that person's environment to, to supplement the interview? The, the first thing to, that I do to find out what kind of B-roll to get is do research in a pre-interview on the phone or whatever to figure out what their routine is, what things are they doing to support their particular thesis, their, their reason for being in the documentary. Uh, then when you go out and actually acquire it, uh, I like to try to get as much uh, in their natural environment as possible. Um, and I like to do it around the interview. I like to do the interview first because that's what seems to be... Actually, let me take that back. I like to do the B-roll first because that gets people at ease with the camera. Uh, because if they're at ease by the time you actually do the interview, they're going to be much better, uh, much better sound bites uh, better quality quotes. Mm -hmm. So how do you, let's talk about pacing a little bit. How do you know what pace fits the story you want to tell uh, and, and what does pacing serve or how does pacing serve the purpose of your story? Mm. Stop me on that one. Never thought about that. Before. Never thought about <laughs> pacing before. Ooh, maybe it's time for a quick recut. Uh. <laughs> So if you, you know, if you start with like an extended shot of slow moving water, like I was watching the videos on your website, you know, that says something about the mood. Yeah. Whereas if you start with quick, 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 bam, 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 a couple of quick clips of interviews, you know, that does something else psychologically for, for your audience. I think you're right. I think depending on how quickly, what your shot count is, how quickly you are showing shots on the screen uh, is going to give the, the audience an emotional reaction. You know, there's, there's, a fish, there's a physical raising of the blood pressure the more shots you're showing on screen, and a physical lowering of the blood pressure and calming effect if you're, showing, if you're holding on that one shot for five seconds or longer. And there's a real power in holding on shots for a great deal of time because it's almost a novelty now to allow the audience to look at everything on the screen to look at the tree in the background with the bird on, in it and how it relates to the story of the person in the foreground making the bird uh, house, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I know that doesn't seem important, but when you give people a chance to see the shot you've composed, 
people really think you're great. <laughs> Uh, so take us through a quick tour of your major documentaries, Bob and Jack's 52-Year Adventure, Trip to Hell and Back, and now uh, Jen Silent. What did you learn from each of these, and how did you grow from each of the films? I grew in leaps and bounds from each film, from one to the other. And I came into it with, say, about 15 to 20 years' experience in television at that point. But what I learned was how to do different levels of filmmaking on my own. I had shot and I had edited and I had written and I had done all the different aspects of it. But where you really learn is how to go the distance with a film, how to budget your time and your resources so that you get the film finished. It doesn't matter if you're good at shooting and good at editing. If you don't have the commitment and the resources to get it finished, you know, it'll be sitting in a closet somewhere. So that's where I, I learned the progressive steps, um, how to do that better and better. Uh, so how do you select? Do we know what time it is? Are we in trouble? Oh, I'm just oh we're fine then. I've, I've got three questions left. Uh, so how do you select which film festivals to uh, send your work to? How does that process work? I think it goes back to looking at what your audience is for your film. If, if I was doing a, um, a documentary about uh, a pilgrimage to Mecca, I would be looking for religious film festivals or spiritual film festivals or festivals in that part of the world where it's a real important, uh, or in this part of, in part of the country where it's important mm -hmm. uh, to show. Um, so you don't just blanket with film festivals out there and you don't just, uh, in my opinion, you don't just send it to Sundance, you do your marketing. That's where your marketing really takes place because it's, that, that, it's at those film festivals that you're going to find other people wanting your work. Uh, so what are you currently working on? What's next for you project-wise? We are continuing to work on different versions of Gen Silent because we feel there's so much potential, not just to show it in settings like this, but to show it to people who are the caregivers and people who make aging policy, uh, to give them a glimpse at what it's like to be an LGBT older person. And we think it's a great training tool. And so for the next mm, six to eight months, we'll be making different versions of Gen Silent for, for those uses. Very cool. And at the end of the day, what is the most rewarding satisfying part of producing and directing a documentary film? The most rewarding part for me is when the lights come up and you see that people have not thought about this before and they realize it's a complicated issue and you have given them information but not an opinion. You have let them see what it's like and are letting them go out the door and decide what they think about it. Very cool. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm sure Scott's probably thinking of a few questions. I have one if we have time. You want to switch spots for a minute? Not really. You can just sit. I fine. can look at him. Yeah, he's, he's a pro. What's the matter? You don't you like sitting on that speaker? That, oh, that oh, handle? He's got really comfortable ridges yeah, here. Yeah, look at that. You can do it in, one, in a minute and a half. I just loved what you, the first thing you said when you were talking about uh, that when you looked at this footage, you sort of felt like almost an eavesdropper um, yeah. on these people's lives. and. Uh, it's not really a question, but if you can just sort of talk about the idea of eavesdropping is the wrong word, but to get very close and very personal with someone and then to share that with however many people are in this room in a way they never would be able to be in that room is seems like a very powerful uh, thing to be able to do. Like a it's not really a question. If you can just sort of talk yeah. to Stacey about that privilege or that how you feel about being a filmmaker. I think that is really the exciting part about being a they filmmaker. Start over. Okay. I think that's really the exciting part about being a filmmaker is that you get to show the most intimate details of a person's struggle or opinion or just day-to-day -day mundane life. And you get to show it in a way that gets people to form an opinion or just gives them a different insight, a level of insight that you would never get if you just had the person up there speaking about their life. When you follow people around and you're allowed to get that close with the camera, really it's, it's a transformative experience for a director and also for the people who are in the film. 
So it's it's a real rewarding. At the end, it should be a rewarding experience for everybody. Tell us a, a story about screening the film. It's been out for about a year or so now. Uh, where that kind of moment really struck home for you, where you had an audience member ask you a question or say something afterwards that made you realize how important it was to do this to do this film. We regularly have people come up in the lobby after the film and say, you know, I never thought about this and I need to figure out what I'm going to do to make sure that I'm not alone when I'm old. That is the most important thing, and it's the most rewarding thing, that maybe you're changing the way somebody's final years are going to be. I think the most rewarding little anecdote was actually when a nursing student came up to me afterwards and said, you know what, I dropped out of nursing school, but this film made me want to go back. I really want to devote my life to helping older people, and especially LGBT older people. Wow, that's got to feel like, you, like you're on the right track. That this was all... You know, for it feels reason. good. It feels a lot better than doing reality television. <laughs> yeah, or some of the other things that I had done earlier in my career. Sure. Can I get one more little phrase? It's just a phrase. You can just look right at Stacy and say, and hopefully for the audience, because you mentioned for the cast members and for the... What's the line you want me to say? And, for, and hopefully for the audience. Ah, and hopefully for the audience. Got it. That's it. Good. And hopefully for the audience. Good. And hopefully for the audience. <laughs> you are a TV guy. So we, <laughs> you were a reporter. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stu. Thanks.